today. So uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 6, uh, starting at verse 25. We'll be going down to verse 34. Undoubtedly, the majority of us will be able to quote at least one of the verses here. Probably verse number 33, that seek ye first verse. Uh, we've heard it time and time and time and time and time again around here at the Lighthouse. But I want to talk to us today about a simple topic. of There is an enemy of our faith. Um, and I want to talk to us about the greatest enemy of to our faith. And it's not the devil. It's not even the flesh. It's a simple thing called worry. You know, it is the great antithesis of faith. You know, when when worry begins to move in and fear and anxiety and all that, that's all part of that same root system there. It can tear us down. It can mess with us. It messes with health, messes with relationships, and we'll get into all that. But I want to encourage us today. Don't be distracted by what's going on around there's a lot of sickness. There's a lot of this. There's a lot of that. There's a, I ain't worried about all that. And hopefully today that we can be reminded, you know, we have a great opportunity to be blessed beyond that. And uh, I heard uh, someone say, bless this mess. Well, that's what God does. You know, when we realize that it, it, God takes something that's imperfect and He makes it perfect in a process. Sometimes we want the perfection instantaneously. We want the we want to be saved from the storm. When Jesus said, "You know, no, we're going through the storm." Uh, we read the story of the, the of uh, the disciples on the boat, and he said, before they even launched off, "Let us go to the other side." Well, halfway across, they come across the storm, and they get all nervous. Well, they they didn't remember that Jesus already said, "We're going to the other side." You know, sometimes getting to the other side. It takes some storms in our life. But uh, in one of the greatest portions of Scripture here, we hear Jesus talking. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Wherefore, I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add to to one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought about raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen. The most notorious killer of all things in all of our life is the simple thing called worry. It goes by other names, such as fear and anxiety. It goes by uh, other faces uh, every t- now and then. But worry, fear, anxiety, whatever you would like to call it, it is the enemy of our faith. It is the killer of faith because it tries to paint a dark, dark picture where there should be sunshine and rainbows. We look around and we long for the sunshine and the rainbows, but when the storm cloud comes in, Oh, we become like those disciples. Master, care you not that we perish? We don't really understand that, you know, the same God that takes us to the mountain sometimes also takes us to the storm. 
But in Matthew chapter uh, 6, verse 25, um, Matthew uses a term in the King James translation says, take no thought. Other translations use the word worry, anxiety, or don't be anxious. It comes from a Greek term called Mirameno, or excuse me, Miram Neo. It is a combination of two smaller terms meaning to divide the mind. See, what worry does is it gets us distracted. Whereas we, once we first come to Jesus, we have a focus. The focus of the cross of Calvary and the seeking of lost souls in preparing not just theirs, but our soul to be ready for the day when He returns. The bride making herself ready for the bridegroom, right? But what happens when worry comes in, it divides the mind. Where we're thinking about that, then we start also thinking about this and this and this. It becomes a great dividing of the mind. You know, uh, James, uh, I believe it was James that said, you know, uh, that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You know, we can't be double-minded. We can't have multiple th- uh, priorities of be- being priority number one. You know, sometimes we focus on what we think should be priority number one, ignoring the fact that God has always said in His Word that He is number one. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all of this other stuff that we seek for priority number one, that will be taken care of along the way. But we see here in this this divided mind, um, it's a simple thing. It distracts. It causes... uh, a lot of different types of distraction there. And the, our English word worry actually comes from the German word worgen, which in that tone means to strangle. So if you think about it rationally, to worry is to strangle out your own faith. To worry is to, uh, to have anxiety and, and all that, is to strangle hold on our life as an individual which then leads to a stranglehold on our health, a stranglehold on our finances, a stranglehold on our walk with God, and a stranglehold with our relationship with others around us. Worry can destroy many things. You know, there's a series called The Little Foxes that goes through all the different little foxes that can spoil your life because they're little things that can become big things. You know, I taught on one already before, but this one here, worry. Oh, me, oh, my. It starts off with something little, but it feeds and it grows and it grows and it grows until it becomes something much larger. It goes beyond itself and starts to become infectious. Have you ever been around a lot of uh, multiple chicken little type people at the same time? Oh, goodness, oh me, the sky is falling. Everything's nasty. Everything's terrible. It can bring you down because you hear all of the fear and anxiety in their own voices. It can distract even the most positive of us to start leaning towards their opinion of, oh, me, oh my, oh, wowsy, wowsy, woozy, everything is going wrong. That is the power of fear. It goes beyond who it starts with. To further exemplify the effects of worry, let's look at um, Mark chapter 4. Um, if you look at the parable of the sower and the seed in Mark chapter 4, you can see that Jesus is talking about fear at one point. And in verses 18 and 19, we won't have to turn there, but Jesus interpreted what he meant about the parable of the seed and talked about the thorn-like worries of the world that choke out the Word, making it unfruitful. Worries struggle the Word of God within us. Worries, fear, and doubt makes this gospel of ill effect in our life. When we get so caught up in the fear and anxiety of the stuff around us, this word starts to mean nothing to us. Well, I know God's, God can heal, but is He going to? I know God could do this, because I've heard that He's done it before. I've seen it before, but I really don't think He's going to do it this time. Because fear and doubt and anxiety begins to take root. 
It is like those thorns that start to choke out the Word. And it makes the uh, it ineffective in our life, making those who once walked in faith become very unproductive people. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 40, Jesus goes to a town called Bethany to visit His dear, dear friends. You may have heard of them, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He was tired after a long day, so he looked forward to relaxing with his friends. However, Martha, one of those friends, uh, she was very concerned about the day because uh, she really wanted to make sure everything had to be perfect, everything had to be right. She was busy running to and fro, making this food, making that food, cleaning this and cleaning that. All the while, Jesus was just sitting there in the midst talking to the friends. And uh, Martha was very uh, turning into a mild frenzy, you could say. And to make it worse to her mind, her sister Mary was just pleased to have the Lord in her house and was just sitting at His feet listening to Him talk. Not concerned about her sister's anxiety attack, saying, that's fine, but Jesus is right here. Martha's getting worked up even more in a frenzy. She's concerned about all this stuff. And then she sees her sister, you know, the person who's supposed to be there with her to help her out, not caring about the frenzy that she's in. In verse number 40 it says that Martha was cumbered about much serving. Other translations say that she was distracted with all of her preparations. That word used for cumbered or distracted is an interesting term in Greek. It's perisipao, which means to be drawn around like being mentally knotted up with frayed emotions. So it's not just distracted like, oh, something shiny. It's to be frayed up. It's to be tied up, to be drawn up, to be wrapped up, to be... Included. How many has ever been in that type of situation where, where everything is just all around you and you feel like you're just being constricted? That was Martha right then and there. She was so constricted with all of her emotions and all the things that she had to do. Her mind was only making things worse and worse and worse. And you know, that's how we can get in the midnight hour when we're all alone and no one else is around and we're left to our own thoughts and we... That we start to think about those thoughts and we just dwell upon it and just make it worse and we amplify the problem instead of magnifying Jesus. It makes it worse. We get drawn around. But then she came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister's not helping? Don't you care that I'm all worked up and she doesn't care a single bit about it? Jesus responded to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered by so many things. Only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. For Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken from her. Martha had to have been taken back like, are you kidding me? The two times, the two words there that he used to describe her attitude, worried and bothered. The first one's translated for worried is the same one that we read in Matthew chapter 6, that anxiety or anxiousness there. Martha was mentally torn. She was trying to do too many things at once. She had a divided mind. Uh, have you ever had too many irons in the fire and none of them could get hot? You're trying to do so, too many, so many things that you're not really doing any one of them really good at all. You're trying to do so much that you're... <laughs> You're making a mess out of everything? That's Martha right there. Martha could not do it by herself. She was struggling. And she complained to Jesus instead of asking for help. She complained and complained and was very torn about everything that was going on. See, worry occurs when we assume the responsibility of things outside of our control. There are many things that are just not inside my box. Can anyone relate? There's tons of stuff that's going on in life that I have no direct control of. I cannot say, change this, and then this changes. Now, God can, but I can't. My employer can, but they're not. 
This one can, but they're not. All these people other than me are making decisions that can affect. I cannot make the decision. I can't make it. the change happen instantly. It's beyond my control. It's out of my box. Does that make me happy? Oh, goodness no. It does not make me one lick of happiness at all. Uh, however, I don't want to ruin my health being caught up about that. I could be completely, totally, and utterly stressed out, and I give you a laundry list of things that are going on in my life that I have no control over that some people would stress and flip out about. But you know what? I don't want to ruin my health. I don't want to ruin my relationships uh, by stressing over these things that I cannot directly or immediately change. If I can't do anything about it, worrying about it's not going to help. But praying about it will always help. Because when you have a little talk with Jesus and you tell Him all about your troubles, amen, He'll hear your faintest cry and He will answer by and by, as the songwriter wrote. You know, when we pray to Him, even if it doesn't change, it changes us. It allows us to become moldable and be able to roll with the punches, as it were. Now, the NIV translates this, situa- the, this story a little bit differently here. It says that his solution was only a few things are necessary, really only one. In our terminology today, you know what he'd be saying? Cool your jets. Calm down, sister. Not everything can be priority number one. That's what he's saying. We have a saying at work. Uh, if everything's in escalation, then nothing's in escalation. Because everybody wants their thing to be the prior- number one priority to be fixed. How can we be so consumed with well, everything has to be a priority? Everything's got to be number one. Everything. Well, I got to do this. I got to do. This. I got to. 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 If you run around with the I gotas, you're going to have the I got nothings. The only thing that you'll have is stress, heart heart problems, money problems, relationship problems, because you're too worried about all the stuff and not wor- not focusing on the real priority. But how can we conquer worry? We can see three different answers or helpful tips uh, that we can see here in the story of Martha. Number one, have realistic expectations. Don't be such an idealistic person that the real world throws you off track. Mary had only one thing occupying her mind and was content to sit and relax at the feet of Jesus. Have realistic expectations. Not everything I touch turns to gold. I am not King Midas. That doesn't happen in real life. That happens in stories from long, long ago. Amen. You know, if I put my hand to it, it might help or it might hinder. But don't ever think that just because you're involved that it's immediately going to succeed. Don't think that just because you think it's a priority... God thinks it's a priority. See, we have to filter everything through the Word. We have to have realistic expectations. You know, one person t- one time told me, hey, I got this job offer and I'm going to be making three times what I make now. That's awesome. But, oh, what's the but? I won't be able, I'll be late for, for Sunday, or have to leave early on Sunday service, and I won't be able to make Wednesday services anymore. Okay, you might want to run that by a pastor. You know, have that little talk there and discuss with you whether that's really a good thing or not. Well, it's a blessing because I really need the money. Are you sure about it? Well, long story short, an individual, sure they got that job. They started making three times what they made. Uh, they didn't pay off all their debts like they thought they were going to do. They just went further into debt. And they ended up uh, losing out on God because they never made God a priority. Never had time to read His Word. Never had time to gather together in uh, uh, services with the brother and the sister here. Didn't have a realistic expectation of what that job was going to do. Sure, made three times as much money, but also demanded three times as much time. Individual lost everything because they didn't have realistic expectations. Number two is refuse to play God. 
Martha had, had a game plan for that day, and she would convince herself that that was God's will, and it was the only way that anything would ever be right. She even went as far as rebuking Jesus for not cooperating with her plans. Now, how many have seen that a time or two over the years? Maybe it was us. Maybe it was someone else. But we've all probably seen where someone said, you know what, this is the will of God for my life. Whether the Word agrees with it, whether the pastor agrees with it, whether the Spirit of God agrees with it, this has got to be the will of God because I want it so bad. Again, God's the one that's in charge. We filter everything through Him. We filter everything through His Word, through His Spirit, and through the man of God. There have uh, been multiple times that I've taken things to Pastor D said, hey, what do you think about this? Now, was his thought going to be, be my final decision? No, but it would greatly influence it. If he said it's not a good idea, okay, then I would look at it a little bit longer to see why, to see it from his perspective. Because I want to make sure I'm right. What is he seeing that I'm not? Sometimes we have that mindset, well, I see this and that's all that matters. That's what happens when we begin to play God. We, we leave God really out of the equation and out of the decision-making process and realize, hey, that's where we first messed up. Then we have to remember, number three, God's character. If you ever need to get out of worry, stress, fear, anxiety... This one right here is your best option to get out of that situation. Remember God's character. Is God good? Amen. Is God just? Is God reliable? Is God faithful? Amen. Worry is like Martha tending to forget that the Lord was immediately capable of handling all of our situations in life. After all, He was right there in her own house. And she didn't seek Him. Folks, no matter what's trying to stress you out, remember, He's still Jehovah Yadra, the Lord who provides. He's still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. He's Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. He's still Jehovah Ra'a, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. He guides me. And you look at that 23rd Psalm, and that's such a beautiful story. He protects me. He beats me when I need it. He provides for me. Everything that you need to know about God, 23rd Psalm, you can find out because He is our shepherd. He will take care of us. But we sometimes get like that that one sheep that tries to run off and do our own thing. And that's when anxiety can strike us. and Worry and doubt and fear can strike us the most when we're trying to do our own thing. But let Him be our shepherd. Let Him lead us. Follow after His voice. Amen. And then my favorite one here. He's Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. If you have anxiety, fear, stress, and doubt, take it to Jesus. Amen. He's our peace. He's our rest. He's our strength. He is everything that we could ever need, all wrapped up in one place. I can't really be consumed by fear when I'm talking to the Master that can speak to the storm, peace be still. When everything is going wrong, I know that He's always right. When everything is going distressful, I know He's the peace speaker. Amen. When everything is going uh, down in health-wise, I still know He's my healer. When the money's gone, when, when everything around me is drying up, guess what? I know He's still my provider. Time would not allow or permit today to go through all the different times where God has provided for me when there was no way. Amen. I will use one example. I got laid off from a job because the company went out of business or at least closed down all operations in this area. Nine months without a job. Nine months. Used up the severance package within three to four weeks. Didn't realize that I was eligible for unemployment for about another two months. But yet, not a single day went by that I did not have food on my plate. 
Not a single day went by that I did not have provision of a place to live, transportation, even an offering when I came to the house of God. But you know, I kept Him first in my praise. I praised Him when it was great. How could I not praise Him when it was bad? Amen. I praised Him all the way through. And you know what? He gave me a job making a lot more than I was making at the previous job. Nine months before. Flash forward nine years. Some of the earlier parts of this lesson could have been preached to me really good. Amen. Because it was getting stressful and whatnot. But you know what? Trusted on Jesus. Found another position making 25% more than I was making at that one. He provided. He took care of. So if I if I got this track record with this God, if, I, if I've seen where He's taking care of me time and time again, so what my company's losing the contract that I'm on and me and 500 other people are out of a job soon? God's got it. He's provided before. He can do it again. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If He did it before, He will do it again. Amen. He is not a respecter of persons. If He did it for me, He can do it for all 500 of the other people. Amen. Just because I'm born again doesn't make me any better than any of them. He loves them just the same. Now, He would love for them all to come to repentance, no doubt. But, you know, they're His children too. He'll take care of them. Amen. We need to learn to trust on Jesus and remember who He is in our time of trouble. You know, we read through the Psalms. That's a great book of songs to listen to. You know, the Lord is my strong tower. He's my refuge. He's my shelter. He's my provision. He's my buckler. He's my shield. Hey, He's all about defending us. He's all about taking care of us. He's all about opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing upon us because we are His children. He made us, shaped in His image. He wants to bless us. There's a saying that I've heard before. Sometimes it's hard to agree with, especially when you're in the situation, but it says, too blessed to be stressed. When we really realize how blessed we really are, some of that stress starts to fade away. We're realizing who we are in Him. Realize who we are in Him. See, worriers are basically dissatisfied people. <clears throat> contentment with the things the way with the excuse me, contentment with the way things are, knowing God can change them if He wished, is a mindset that is completely foreign to the worrier. God loves me. I love God. Now I, I'm certain. He doesn't have to change a single thing in my life. Because He loves me, I know He wants to. Don't ever forget that God wants to help you. Sometimes He's just waiting on us to do our part. See, we can't ask God to do something and not be willing to do what He asks of us. We have to sometimes say, you know what, Jesus, whatever you want, it's yours. We We try to barter with God. We try to say, well, if you do this, then I'll do that. That's not how it works. He's the one that writes the covenants. He's the one that makes the decisions here. He's already said in His Word that if we do this, then He'll do that. Or He'll do this, and then we can do this. Perfect cycle of relationship there. God is in charge. And we'll take care of our worries if we let him. I'll close with this poem written by a 14-year-old, Jason Limon, called The Present Tense. It was spring, but it was summer that I wanted with the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I longed for. The beautiful snow and the long joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted. The warmth and the blossoming of nature. 
I was a child, but it was adulthood that I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted to be mature and sophisticated. I proved that one wrong. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 that I wanted again, the youth and that free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age that I wanted, the presence of mind without limitation. Then my life was over, and I never really got what I wanted. Always worrying about what they could have, or what they used to have, not focusing on what they have right now. Folks, we got Jesus. Amen. I don't care about tomorrow or yesterday. The things that I do have or the things that I don't have. Because I have Him. He included the subject of worry in His Sermon on the Mound. In Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 18, He warns against parading out our acts of righteousness. Simply, we don't brag. In verses 19 through 24, He warns against falling into the trap of materialism. Don't be distracted by the things of this world. In verses 25 through 32, he warns against being preoccupied with the wrong things. In other words, don't worry, be happy. In verses 33 and 34, he warns against anticipating all of tomorrow's concerns today. Don't be in a hurry. Our relief from worry is found here in verses 33 and 34. And uh, I'm going to read it from a different translation because it makes it a little easier to really understand. It says, But seek first, king, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble in it to its own. Folks, don't worry. Be happy. You know, we don't have to stress. We don't have to fret. We can trust in Jesus no matter what the problem is, whatever the situation is, whatever the stronghold is. Jesus is able to defend. Jesus is able to destroy. Jesus is able to take over whatever is messing with our lives and turn it into something else. Song of Solomon says, There is a time for everything under the sun. There is a time for joy. There is a time for sorrow. There is a time for mourning. There is a time for gladness. You know what? No matter what we need, what we have right now, if we give it to Jesus, He'll give us something better right back. Amen. we got about seven or so minutes before the children come up from downstairs. Let's use this opportunity as Brother Chris plays some music there. Spend the time in prayer and say, Lord, help me apply some of this to my life today. And Thank you for the reminder that you are large and in charge, that no matter what comes our way, you can be a blessing in our life. And we don't have to worry about the enemy of our faith because you've got it all under control. Shall we pray today?